Hallelujah. Father, we do worship you this morning. We just praise you and thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy, your grace, and your love for us. Father, we just pray and, and believe, Father, that uh, the sacrifice of praise this morning, the worship was uh, honoring to you, Lord, and we just ask that you would receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, this morning, we are going to endeavor a, a series on the book of Acts. And I'm excited about it. You know, at, at the present, we do not have evening services. When we did, many times I would go through a book of the Bible, uh, verse by verse, and I love doing that. But uh, we uh, haven't done it for quite some time. And I'm looking so forward to it, and I hope you will enjoy and receive abundantly from the Word of God as we uh, uh, take off in this new adventure in the book of Acts. And, uh, uh, we're going to be here a while, all right? Everybody say amen. amen. We're going to be here, not today. Well, we might be, I don't know, but I'm not we're going to be in the book of Acts for a while. Some of you are getting nervous there, weren't you? Yes. No, we're going to be here a while. But uh, actually, uh, we're going to be in the book of Acts. Even if I did a chapter a week, that's 28 weeks, we'll be in the book of Acts. And uh, I'm hoping to get past the first verse this morning. Now, actually, I'm planning on going through the whole chapter. And uh, I might go just a little bit longer than normal. I try to stay around a half an hour or 35 minutes. We may go up to about 40 minutes. And, uh, you know, if you need to, you know, kind of shift sides or something every 15 minutes. Amen. But we are going to start in the book of Acts and we're going to be looking at the early church. And this is the beginning of the church. Amen. And you know, we attend Crosswalk Fellowship. I believe everybody here attends Crosswalk Fellowship. And uh, we are a local church. But we have to realize the local church is a picture of the church. People see the church through local churches. And we are one of those local churches that are a manifestation of the body of Christ. So as we gather together and do what we do, we are manifesting the body of Christ. Even as we sing and worship and pray and all the different uh, things, uh, the study of God's Word, it's all manifesting the body of Christ. So we're going to begin at the beginning this morning. In chapter 1, verse 1 of the book of Acts. Now, we will have the scriptures on the screen, which will help you if you're taking notes. But I would also encourage you, I know we can kind of get out of the habit of bringing our Bibles since we know the words will be on the wall. But I would encourage you to bring your Bible so you can maybe mark in your Bible. And yes, it's okay to mark in your Bible, amen? And, uh, you know, the whole idea of the Bible is not that it's a holy uh, material, but it's getting that Word of God in your heart that's holy. And, and writing in your Bible, making notes helps you do that. Then all the better. Amen? Are you ready? I just feel like I'm at the starting gate of, of the marathon. And uh, we're going to begin with verse 1. And it reads, The former, the former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Now when he says the former account... I made, he's referring to the book of Luke. Okay? Uh, the book of Acts is uh, somewhat a, a continuation of the gospel of Luke. You could call it Luke 2, or the second book of Luke, because he wrote Luke, then he turned around and he wrote the book of Acts. The same writer of both books, can anybody tell me who, who his name is? Who wrote the book of Luke and Acts? Look, very good. All right. I can't get anything over on you, can I? So, Luke wrote the book of Acts. Now, it's also known as the Acts of the Apostles. Better uh, 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 title would be the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the Apostles. Okay? So, as we begin to look, it's, it's talking about the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the Apostles. And he starts out again, the former account I made, that's the book of Luke, he is writing to this person named Theophilus. 
And he says, O Theophilus. Now let's just stop there for a moment. The greeting Theophilus. Now, when you look at this, Theophilus, Theo, means in the Greek, God. It's where we get our word theology from. Theo, Godology, study. Theology is what? The study of God. Amen. So you hear people talk about theology. It's not something way out there. Basically, theology, when you talk about theology, is talking about the study of God. So we have Theophilus, Theo, God. Uh, uh, Theophilus, Theophilus is uh, uh, from the word phileo, which means what? Love. So basically, his name means lover of God. So he's right to this person whose name signifies lover of God. Now the bottom line in our Christian life church is this, that we be lovers of God. Really. I mean, you know, we, we try to get so caught up in so many different things, but we are called to be lovers of God. God called, created us that He might have fellowship with us. Amen. And that is why we have a free will. God has given us a free will so that we can choose to love Him. Amen? You know, if, he, if you make somebody love you, that's not really love, is it? And some people look at God that way, like, well, if we don't uh, act like we love God, He'll beat us until we do. You know, He's just going to... I was guilty of it. When I first got saved, I'd go up to people and say, you better obey God, or He'll knock you so far down on the ground you have to pull your shoes off to see. You know, I mean, God will get you no. What kind of love is that? If, if He makes us love Him. No, that's why He gave us a free will. That's why there's a choice to, to obey Him or not to obey Him. And Jesus says, you know, all men know you're my disciples because of your love for one another. Amen. So we see the commandment, first of all, is what we, you know, we used to have ten commandments, now we have two. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Amen. So on. Mine. So, and love your neighbor as yourself. Actually, you could say we have three commandments. Love God, love your neighbor, and love yourself. Amen. A lot of people have a hard time with that third one. Loving yourself. But you see, God has shown mercy and grace, and He said, now I want you to love yourself. I mean, how can we love our neighbor as ourselves if we don't love ourselves? Amen. So, now I mean, we don't get carried away. Amen. Uh, you know, we're still to esteem others higher than ourselves. And even that doesn't mean we're to be a doormat. It just means that we are not to look out only for our own needs, but we need to look out for the needs of others. Amen? So, we see this Theophilus, which means lover of God, and we understand that that's what we need to do. We, we, we need to be lovers of God. We, and, 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 well, I love God, but we need to show our love for God. Amen? He said, if you love me, you'll what? Keep my commandments. Amen? So, uh, how do we show God we love Him? By keeping His commandments. You know, I can tell my wife every day I love her, but if I'm not put some action with that, it's not going to mean much, is it? But, you know, words are empty. But whenever we add action behind those words, then those words really mean something. I say, I love you. She goes, I know you do. You see? Because I can tell by the way you treat me every day. You know, how you're faithful to me and, and so forth. Well, we show God our love the same way. By how we treat him, and not only him, but others, because he said that you know what you've done to the least of these, you've done it unto me. So we show our love for God and how we treat one another, and uh, that's been, and you know and God loves unity, Amen, and God loves mercy, and He wants us to show those things in the way that He shows it to us. So we'll go on. We're still in verse one, Amen. Jesus, it goes on to say, "O Theophilus, of all that Jesus." Begin both to do and to teach. Okay, let's look at this for a moment. Jesus did, then He taught. He did, then He taught. You see, Jesus would pray, and they would see Him praying, and they would say, teach us to pray. And then He would teach them to pray. Jesus went about healing and doing good unto all. Amen. And then He would teach them how to go about healing and doing good. He did it, then he taught. You see, he, uh, he was informational and he was relational. He gave them the information, but he also related it to them. He was mentoring, but he's also modeling. Amen? So, uh, there's a quote 
that's pretty famous today. I'm going to burst somebody's bubble here in a moment. I'm pretty good at that, though, aren't I? But uh, there's, there's a famous quote. It says, uh, uh, how's it say that? Uh, uh, I wrote it down. Preach the gospel, and when you have to, use words. Anybody ever heard that? Preach the gospel, and when you have to, use words. And supposedly that was a quote from Francis of Assisi. Well, here's the thing. Francis of Assisi never said that. Matter of fact, he really did the opposite of that. He preached often and long. You know, so he used a lot of words. He preached the gospel all the time. You know, in Romans it says, for I, uh, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. And we preach the gospel. We use words. Now, I understand what they're saying is live it so that people can see it. But you know, just a good moral life doesn't lead anybody to Christ. Now, we do need a good moral life. We do need a life showing works of, uh, for the kingdom to back up our words. But we have to use words. Amen. You know, just being living a good Christian life will not tell anybody. I mean, there's, there's people out there, church, that aren't saved that are better than a lot of people that are saved. You know, I mean, they're good people as far as, you know, doing nice things and being nice. I met some mean Christians. I tell you, I've been in this for over 30 years. I, I, I've met some mean Christians. Matter of fact, I wanted to get mean a few times. I've had some board meetings before. You know, I, I heard this was one preacher I used to listen to. I had some cassette tapes many, 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 many years ago. His, his name was Sam Cathy. He's an old Baptist preacher. And I remember him saying, all these pastors having problems with their deacons. I don't have any problems with my deacons. I just tell them, we'll step outside and settle it. And he was serious. You know? <laughs> There's a time or two that I had a couple of deacons. I'd like to have stepped outside and settle it. I wish it was that easy. But uh, I have the greatest deacons now that a pastor could ever uh, dream of, you know, with uh, Mike and Tom. But at any rate, uh, we, we need to show love, and we also need to preach the gospel along with living the gospel. Amen. They go hand in hand. Hallelujah. All right. Let's move on. So in the first book, Luke... We see that he would do and teach. In the second book, we see that Jesus continued to do and to teach. Now, just as a side note, I just thought this was interesting. The life of Jesus uh, covers 33 years. Well, the book of Acts also covers a span of about 33 years. I just thought that was a little interesting uh, piece of history. So he came to do the will of God. What did he come to do? He came to save people from their sin. Amen? And uh, he, he laid aside his deity for 33 years. Boy, he lived a perfect life. He died. He was glorified. He was raised. And he ascended. And he did all of this in a human body. Now, when I say he laid aside his deity, that does not mean he was no longer deity. He is still part of the Trinity. Amen? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but he chose not to walk in the deity. Everything that Jesus did, he did as a human being, empowered by the Holy Spirit. That's why he did not begin his ministry until the Holy Spirit came upon him. Remember his baptism? And the Holy Spirit came upon him in the form of dove, and then he went out into the wilderness, and then he came back in power. Amen? He came back under the power of the Holy Spirit. That is to show us that everything He did, we also can do. Matter of fact, it says, the works that He did, you shall do also. And greater works than these you shall do because He said, I go to be with the Father. Now, somebody said, how can you do greater works than that? Okay, well, let's just leave that aside. You know, some say that means more because there's more of us. We have more time. Let, let's, although it says, you know, they recorded all the miracles that Jesus did, they said you couldn't even hold them in the biggest library. I mean, the Bible only records part of it. You see, he did way more than the Bible even records. So he was just walking miracle, amen? He just miracle, 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 and, and, and such power. But it says the works that he did, we shall do also. So what did he do? I mean, he opened blind eyes, he opened deaf ears, made the cripple walk, you know, uh, raised the dead, 
So he did all these, and the works that he did, we shall do also. Now he did all this in a human body by the power, the unction of the Holy Spirit. And we too have been given the power of the unction of the Holy Spirit that we can do the works that he did. So what I'm saying is this. We are body number two. He came and worked through the body of Jesus. Now he works through the body of Christ. Amen. And we're the body of Christ. And he does those works through us. You need a little more evidence for that? Look at John 20. Verse 21. Listen to what Jesus says here. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. You see, we're that second body. We're the body of Christ. He has sent us out into the world to continue to do and teach what He started doing and teaching. Amen? And you know, the, chap the last chapter of Acts, chapter 28, does not end Acts. It doesn't end. Look to your neighbor and say, you're Acts 29. Amen? You're, you're the next chapter of Acts. The body, the church is still here and still doing the work for God. Amen? Also, let's just take a look at uh, <clears throat> Matthew chapter 18, verses 18 through 20. <clears throat> Again, us, our being the second body, the body of Christ where God uh, works through, Jesus works through. It reads there, and Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given unto me in heaven and on earth. So stop there for a moment. All authority has been given unto me, Jesus, he said. Now he goes on to say, Go therefore. Now, the you is understood here, correct? Any English teachers here? You is understood. You go therefore. And make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So he said, all authority has been given to me. Now what he's doing is, he's delegating that authority. He's saying, authority has been given to me. Now you go in my name. You go in my authority. And you teach and you disciple, and you baptize in my authority. You see, it's got nothing to do with us. We're just His body. Amen? He's the one working through the body. You see? And He says, you go therefore in my name. And then also take a look at Mark 16, 17 and 18. In, in the book, Gospel of Mark, chapter 16, 17 and 18. I don't believe I gave that one to Jake, but he's going to look that up so you can see it, so I can see it. Because I just added this in a moment ago. In Mark 16, 17 and 18. Actually, I quoted part of it a while ago. A while ago. And it reads there, listen, and these signs will follow those who believe. Do you believe this morning? These signs will follow those who believe. In my name, listen, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. He said, all authority has been given unto me. Now you go in my name. You go in my authority. You make disciples. You uh, teach them. You baptize them. You lay hands, hands on them. You cast out devils in my name. Because I'm working through you. Amen. Hallelujah. Did you hear that? You go in my name. You see, I have... Hang on. Man. I have a Bank of America credit card. I have a church credit card. I have a debit card. I got a... I, I got a Fifth third debit card. Uh, maybe that's it. <laughs> no, I have another uh, Visa card in here somewhere. Okay, I got a Lowe's card. Now, you know how far those things will get me? You know how far those will get me? It might get me to Hopkinsville. <laughs> that's about it. But you know if uh, Bill Gates came in here, and gave me his credit card, 
Guess how far I could go? I could charter me a private jet. I could fly over to Paris for lunch. I could maybe go check out Japan. I mean, I, the, I mean, the sky's the limit. Amen. Well, you know, in our own authority, in our own power, it gets about as far as those credit cards and debit cards right there gets. It gets down the road just a few blocks. Amen. But when Jesus said. He's given us His authority. Sky's the limit. We can lay hands on sick and see the, uh, uh, the sick recover. We can even raise the dead in His name. Amen? In His power and His authority. Hallelujah. Oh, I get excited about that. It's like Cheryl says, we just got to get it from here to here. It is now Christ in us doing the work of the ministry. Hallelujah. All right. Verse 2. And we will get quicker here, okay? Verse 2. Until the day in which he was taken up after he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. So here in Acts, Luke will show us how that great commission will be carried out to go make disciples of all nations. What does he say? Well, jump to verse 8 if you would. We're going to come back to verse 2, but jump over to Acts 1.8 real quick and listen to what it says there. You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Now let's jump to verse 3. To whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs. Now listen to this. Being seen, this is after he was crucified and rose from the dead, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Now, this verse intrigues me. I mean, the fact that when he rose again, he didn't hang around for lunch and then ascend into heaven. <clears throat> no. He hung around for 40 days. Many people saw him. He talked to them about the things of the kingdom of God for 40 days. Then it's interesting that over in the Gospels, Jesus' last words were, Go! Everybody say go. Go. Go, go make disciples of all nations. But we're going to see here in just a moment. He says, Wait! Go! Last words of the Gospels. But then he turns right around and says, Wait! Verse 4. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait. Everybody say wait but to wait for the promise of the Father which He said, You have heard from Me. Now, I would assume they're chomping at the bit. They are ready to go tell. They are ready to go share this good news. We as believers ought to be ready. Amen? We ought to be ready to go tell people about this wonderful news. I mean, you have been saved. You have been forgiven. Shown grace and mercy. And we have this wonderful message to tell the world to tell our neighbors, to tell our family, to tell our co-workers, I've been forgiven, I've been saved, I've been set free, and I have good news for you. You can be set free. You can be forgiven. I would assume they're chomping in the bit to tell everybody what they see. We saw Him die, and we saw Him rise from the dead. We talked with Him. He spoke to us about the things of the kingdom of God. I can, I can see them saying, why? Why do we got to wait, Jesus? I want to go now. I want to tell now. Jesus basically says, because of what I told you before, back in John 14 through 16. Now, he didn't say what I told you back before in John chapters 14 through 16 because at that time there were no, there was no John chapter 14 through 16. It hadn't been read yet. Amen. And then it wasn't put into chapter and verse until sometime later. And, and so you understand that, amen? But he's talking about what happened 
back in John chapter 14 through 16, when he talked about there being power uh, and witnessing, he told them another was coming to teach them, to comfort them, and to empower them. He's referring back to what I said back then. Then Acts 1.8. Here's how we'll fulfill the Great Commission to go and tell. That you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses. With the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they were given the power to be witnesses. That is why he told them to wait. He said, wait till you receive this power. Wait till you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit that you might go out in power. They needed this power before they began their ministry. We as well as they need this power to witness. If we try to do it in our own power, we would not be very effective. But if we do it in the power of the Holy Spirit, we can do great things in His kingdom. Amen? He's already told them all this back in Luke, but now He's giving them a little refresher course. Look at verse 5. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Verse 6. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked Him, saying, Now, now, let me just stop for a moment. He just said, John baptizes with water. You're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Not many days from now. That's pretty cool, isn't it? But then look what they do. They go, when they come together, they ask and say, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. I mean, my question is, where did this come from? He's talking about, you're going to be baptized in the Holy Spirit not many days. Then they start talking about something else. Well, what happened was, they were just getting off point. And notice he really doesn't answer them, does he? he? He just reels them back in. Don't worry about that right now. You've got a job to do. You're going to receive power in a few days. You're going to be my witnesses. You're going to go about teaching and doing the work of the ministry. Verse 8, again. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We are given power to witness. We are given power to tell people about Jesus and what He's done for them. Hallelujah. They can know Him. They can have a, a personal relationship with Him. You know, that's the main purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You know, much of the church have made it about something else. You know, we, we, we made the baptism of the Holy Spirit about speaking in tongues. We, a lot of people think that's the point of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is to speak in tongues. No, speaking in tongues is an evidence. If you've been baptized in the Holy Ghost, you can speak in tongues whether you do or not. You can. Amen. That, it says that's the initial physical evidence. That's the evidence that you... I say one of the evidences. There's, there's quite a more evidence that you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. But... That's not the purpose of it. Amen? What is the purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit? It's to receive power to be a witness for Him. Now, speaking in tongues is great. I'm like Paul. I thank God I speak in tongues more than all of you. I don't know if I do or not. But I mean, I, I, I thank God for that. Amen? I, I, it comes in uh, really handy whenever I'm praying. I don't know what to pray about or how to pray about it. I can just pray in the Holy Spirit and pray in tongues and let the Holy Spirit pray through me. But, but that's not the purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The purpose is to receive power to be a witness. You know, some people brag about, well, you know, I'm spirit-filled, I speak in tongues. And I, do you have any power? Do you feel the Holy Ghost coming upon you when you're witnessing? You know, that's where the power is at. You know, Paul also said, you know, even though I, I speak in tongues of angels and men, if I don't have love, I'm nothing. I'm just a loud sounding symbol. Speaking in tongues does not make you spiritual. Come on. Now, I'm not against it, of course, obviously. But that's not what this is about. And we'll talk more about that in the next chapter. But let me move on. You see, if we make ourselves available to this power of the Holy Spirit, 
He'll use us to change people's lives for eternity. Amen. Okay, look, I'll recover a few. I told you we're going to get a little quicker. Verses. You see, I'd love to be able to spend much time on every verse, but it'd be a five-year plan if I did that. So let's go ahead and look at verses 9 through 11. Now, when he had spoken these things, while they watched, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Now get this picture. They're standing there, and Jesus just starts ascending into heaven. And they're looking. And there's some clouds up there, and it just disappears into the clouds. And they're just, wow. And all of a sudden, there's these two angels. Hey, guys, what you looking at? <laughs> he just went up there. Oh, that's nothing. He's going to come back the same way. If they did not already have enough to be excited about Jesus dying and seeing him raised from, raise from the dead, talking to him for 40 days afterwards, now they saw him ascend into heaven. Pretty awesome. How many of you were here with us on Allen's Lane? Well, look at that. Look how many people have been here since Allen's Lane. Two thirds of them. Now, when we were on Allen's Lane, there was this gentleman that would come to our church. He did for a short season. I don't, I don't know how to say this politically correctly, but he just wasn't quite right. Is that okay to say? He just wasn't quite right. And he always had some kind of far out thing to say. He was a prophet of God. And he, he came, and, and the last time I talked to him, he was telling me how God told him to drive his pickup truck to, I think it was Bilo, or IGA now, and to park it in the parking lot. He was going to stand in the bed of the truck, and God was going to, Beating him up into heaven. So I said to him, hey, let me know when you're going to do that because I'd like to see it. Well, he must have went and did it without telling me because I never saw him again after that. <laughs> Who knows? Look at verse 12 through 14. It says, Then they returned to Jerusalem, from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. Now, a Sabbath day journey is less than a half a mile because on the Sabbath day, uh, they, they could not walk, according to the law, they couldn't walk over a half a mile. So, less than a half mile. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the seventh, and Judas the son of James, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. So we, here we see this great prayer meeting being prepared and set up. Amen? And we're going to visit that room again next week in chapter 2, the upper room. The church, great things are birthed through prayer. Let me say that again. Great things are birthed through prayer. Somebody say amen. amen. We're called to pray as individuals and we're called to pray corporately. You know, it's a shame that both Individual prayers and corporate prayer are very much neglected today in most any church. You know, you can have a, 
a, a, a fellowship meeting and pack the house. You can have a prayer meeting, you'd be lucky if four people show up. I mean, I'm not just saying here, I, you know, we may have had more than that, I don't know, but in most churches, I mean, it's pretty much common in most churches. You call, we're going to have a prayer meeting Wednesday night. You might get four or five people come pray out of, I even have a church of two or three hundred. You might get a dozen, maybe. I always say in a small church, you really got good percentages. You know what I mean? If you have 40 people and you have your four people show up, well, hey, you got 10% of the church game. You got eight, you know, eight people, well, boy, it just really jumps up, amen. But the sad part is, you know, when you get bigger churches, those percentages really look bad. But it's just pretty much neglected today. But yet we say we believe in prayer. We say, you know, uh, prayer changes things. We, we, we say great things are birthed in prayer, but yet we don't really take the time and effort to do that. Look at verse, eight, verse uh, 15 through 20. We'll get close to wrapping it up here. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Altogether, the number of names was about 120, and said, Men and brethren, the Scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before the mouth of David, Concerning Judas. So now he's going to talk about Judas and what happened to Judas. Who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. He guided those and he set it up and planned it to arrest Jesus. For he was numbered with us and obtained a part of this ministry. He was part of the twelve uh, disciples. Amen. Now this man purchased a field with the wages of iniquity. That's the money he received for betraying Jesus. And falling headlong, it says he burst open in the middle and all his entrails gushed out. He committed suicide. And it became known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem. So that field is called in their own language, Akel Dama, that is the field of blood. And he goes on to say, for it is written in the book of Psalms, and I realize that's Old Testament, that's before any of this happened, before Jesus even came to the earth. So for in the book of Psalms, it says, let his dwelling place be desolate and let no one live in it. Let another take his office. So it's talking about Judas. How he it prophesied many years ago that he would commit suicide and uh, uh, he was one of the twelve apostles and now they need somebody else to take his place. So again, this was prophesied beforehand. So Peter's relating to the disciples what Judas had done. Therefore, uh, he was no longer with them, but the fact remains they still need 12 apostles. They need to choose somebody to replace Judas. Now, uh, the last of our reading here, we're beginning with verse 21. Therefore, these men who have accompanied us all the time, that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to the day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. And they proposed to Joseph called Barasabas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, O Lord, who know the hearts of all men, show which of these two you have chosen to take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. Don't want to know where that's at. But, and they cast their lots, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven. Okay, so there was a couple of requirements here in choosing this apostle. Uh, they had to have seen Jesus and had to uh, witness his resurrection. They had two in mind: Joseph called the Sabbath, and who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. Now, basically, here you have a guy with three names, and you had Matthias. They prayed for God to show which one they should pick to become the next apostle. And it says they cast their lots, and the lot fell on Matthias. Now, casting lots, let's just talk about that very briefly. That was like flipping a coin today. That'd be kind of the same thing as flipping a coin. And let me just add, this is not a good example for how we make big decisions today. Okay, Lord, we're praying, just, you know, it's his... You know, make it. If you want us to do this, make it heads. If you want to do the other, make it tails. That's not a good example. That's not how we make a major or any decision today. How do we make decisions today? Well, first of all, we have the Word of God, Amen, to guide us. 
in our decision making. We have a Holy Spirit that is active in our lives. And we have a personal relationship with Jesus. And we'll talk about how to know the will of God another time. Uh, I'll be glad to talk about it now that maybe you're ready to head on over to the restaurant or head home and get dinner going. So we'll close here in a moment. But uh, there's no need to flip a coin today. Amen? There's no need to use uh, uh, means of chance to hear from God. We have the Holy Spirit in our lives. So if you have a major decision, go to the Word. Amen? Pray about it. Ask the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart. Ask Him to guide you. And He'll do that. He'll help you. He'll, he'll give you peace in your decisions that you make. And in closing this morning, you know, every Sunday morning, or actually every day, but every Sunday morning we're gathered here together, you have a decision to make. The greatest decision you can ever make is to receive Jesus Christ into your life, into your heart. Amen? And if you have not done that, as I look around, I believe all of you have. But if you ever have a question about that, please see me. Amen. And we'll pray and talk and you can know that you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. Another decision we have, and we'll talk more about it next week. You have a decision to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You see. To receive power. Everybody say power. Power to be a witness for Him. Don't let that term scare you off. You know, as far as I'm concerned, anything that's going to give me more power to be a witness for Him, I want it. Amen? I told God, I don't know how many years ago, when I was 18, 19 years old, I said, God, if it's from you and you want me to have it, I want it. Amen? And that was my prayer. And I can talk about that maybe next week. But I want to be a witness for Him. Amen? I want to be an effective a witness for Him. I want to stay filled with the Holy Spirit that He can use me to minister and reach out and touch and change lives of those around me. Let's pray. Father, again, we are so thankful for Your goodness and for Your love and mercy. Lord, we thank You for the Word of God. We thank You that You have given us all the instructions that we can go to. And here in America, Father, we all either have a Bible or, or two or three or four or five or more. And for those who don't, uh, they're, they're very accessible. And Lord, we just thank You for the gift of Your Word. We thank You, Lord, that it's so uh, uh, in reach. And Lord, I just pray that we would take advantage of You uh, giving us this blessing. And Lord, I thank You that it's not just a book, but it's a book that speaks to us and leads us and guides us. So Lord, this morning, I pray and trust, Lord, that we've all made a decision for Christ. And Lord, let us be open to receive all that you have for us. And Lord, we're careful to give you all the praise and all the glory. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Before we